Have you written that book yet? Uh, no. Have you made your film yet? Uh, nope. Have you done anything except watch reruns of Miss Fisher? Not so much. Oh, God, just as well at Alex Waddleton for you to teach you how to get stuff done, Esther. Welcome to Running Free Skills. Um, in our previous session, we talked about how to wrangle an idea and where to get one. And if you're really stuck, for ideas then you need to head straight over to rightbrainworkout.com to discover the fantastic work being done by Alex Waddleton and Russell Hancroft. Um, but right now what we've got, we're going on the next bit of the journey to being creative and that's turning an idea into an action and to teach us what he's learned and how to do this is the fantastic Alex Waddleton. So, Alex. Thanks for thank, having me. No, thank, thank you. I'm really excited. I think the work you've done is incredible, and I love that you really embrace that notion of just doing it. So, can you give me a potted history of your career? Yeah, so I've worked in the advertising industry probably for two decades, which I know it's hard to believe because I'm only 26. Uh, but I've worked in advertising. I've worked in lots of big agencies for about most of that time. Um, in the last two years, I've pretty, pretty much gone out on my own and just become a freelance sort of independent creative director, I guess. Um, and I mostly do now social change, sort of good, good for the world things, because I kind of got to an age where I had young kids. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I want to give back a little bit more. So I kind of do that sort of stuff nowadays. Um, things that you might have seen that I've done when I was in advertising. Uh, I did the Wrigley's Food Creatures. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but that ran in like... 40 countries around the world and stuff that ended up, they ended up starring opposite uh, Antonio Banderas, uh, Ashton Kutcher and Sarah Silverman. I didn't see a dollar of it, but it was pretty cool. I had, I'd had friends go on holidays and send me photos of these of the little food creatures with different in subtitles with different languages and stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, but since then um, I've done um, like the right brain workout book, as you said, with Russell. Um, I also uh, basically helped, create a statue in honouring Nikki Winmar, which I think we might talk about later on, and also did Future Landfill, which was Lion King Ushish and rejiggering that to sort of stop the plastic promotion. So they're kind of the main highlights of the stuff I do, but yeah, I just kind of just am coming up with ideas and making them with my friends nowadays is pretty much what I do full time. That sounds, that sounds like the best career ever. So I've got an idea, it's bloody great. What should, what's, what should I do? What's the first thing you recommend I do? Just try to start making it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to get on with it. Because uh, my career in advertising is very much everything has to wait until it's perfect. And so you have to wait for 15, 25 people's opinions. And by the time you do that, everything gets watered down. Uh, a really good example of that. Um, was when I was working on a brief when I was working in the DDB Sydney, which is an agency in Sydney. I was working on this brief for a 30 second TV commercial. And the time it took us to get the brief and to make the ad, they had built a 17 story building next door to where I was working. I'd seen this thing just go up week by week by week. And I'm like, we made an ad and then it was on air for two weeks and that was it. And I was just like, this is crap. So now I kind of just do little things, which I kind of, I like doing a lot of things that I'm doing for free just because I like doing them. And I just tell my friends, I tell everyone about an idea. And then because I tell everyone about the idea, I have to do it. <laughs> if you know what I mean? I think that's the best motivator is fear of people laughing at me uh, makes me do stuff. <laughs> and I love what you're saying about um, perfection and that idea of not waiting for the perfect solution because you're right like to make a there is no perfect there is all that not even an advert is perfect like, there's always just a frame or something that could be better um, well if everything was perfect humans would stop inventing things because like it's like you think about a koala to them their life is perfect i get i wake up I have some gum leaves, I get stoned, I sleep, I wake up, and that's what they do. That's what they're doing for centuries. They're still going to be doing it probably after we're all gone, but that's our human need is to keep doing things and because we can always improve, it's the old thing standing on the shoulders of giants. We all, no one, you know, learnt when they were five years old, discovered the wheel. That was discovered so long ago, but we've just kept improving it and using it in different ways, and I think that's what we all have as humans. That's just 
really exciting that we have over everything else that's on the planet. We've got this imagination and this creativity to want to do to keep improving things. And I think that's really cool. And I think it's a blessing that sometimes we forget. So um, I just keep trying to spread the gospel of like, if an idiot like me can make stuff happen, anyone, anyone at home can do it. So you talked to me in the past about how you used to keep your ideas to yourself. You didn't share them. Yep. And that now you are like the opposite. If you have an idea, you tell everyone. What's, What's the benefit of that? And do you ever worry that, Pete, you're going to tell somebody about an idea and they're going to go, that's rubbish? Um, I do worry about that a little bit. But then if they say it's rubbish, enough people say it's rubbish, then maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but if I have an idea that I just keeps reminding me, it just keeps saying, I have this thing, keeps tapping me on the shoulder and going, that's a good idea. That means I must need to do it. Like if I work on something for a while and then I stop doing it because I get sidetracked having to pay the bills and stuff and then something goes, Alex, you need to do that idea. That must mean it's good. So I just keep going at it and going at it like that, I guess. I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, just, just keep going at things. Now, so that means that you have a kind of a dual life. You've got your stuff that you do that's your ideas and that you're following through, and you've got the stuff that you do that pays the bills. How do you combine that? How, how do you manage those two things creatively? Well, because I now have all these things on the side, when the things that I'm working on don't go exactly to plan, it doesn't absolutely destroy me like it used to. Like I used to have my career, if I had a good ad, go south and not go as I wanted to go, I would be depressed and I would be really grim and I'd be real angry. I, I'd get angry at account service and I'd, you know, throw the toys out the cot and stuff. And it didn't actually make the work any better. It just made me look like an asshole. <laughs> so now I've got all these other things that if something in my paying work doesn't go so well, it doesn't stress me as much. I'm like, well, I'm doing the best I can and this is the process. It's still going to be good. But I've got all these other things and if the other things stuff up, it's my fault. But nothing I've done on the side is stuffed up because I just have the passion to do it. And I, like I said, because I keep telling everyone about my ideas, they just keep getting better and better. And I keep taking the best bits of things that people say and adding that into the idea or, you know, because if, if I wanted to do everything on my own, I wouldn't get anywhere because I can't, I'm a terrible photographer. My speaking voice is awful. I've got this enormous nose. I can't compose shots, but I know all these amazing, clever people and I can use all their talents and together we can do something better to bring my stupid idea that I came up at three o'clock in the morning and do some, do some good with it. Mm. So that is a perfect segue into talking about future landfill. Cause I think I'm going to get you to talk us through the case study because it basically is a case study in getting shit done and using the talents of all your creative friends and for really good purposes, you had you did a campaign that had a massively positive impact on all of our lives and our planet. So that's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. I like to do that sort of stuff. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video for people who haven't seen some of the imagery from it. There was Lion King little wishies that we'll sort of promotion with. Um, um, my kids got given some by like, you know, family, friends sort of thing and they brought them home and the kids got them and they tore them open and they were like so excited. They were like, oh my God, I've got a special rare one. I'm like, sure you do, whatever. And then three minutes later they were out playing on the trampoline like they'd forgotten about them already. And so I was looking at one of the wishes. I literally held it in my hand and went, now the Lion King's about the circle of life, isn't it? How can this plastic thing like it doesn't have any use i think it's like a pencil topper had like a hole in the bottom i think you could use it that was the only use for them. not a real use how is that living up to the circle of life so it just i was holding it and i just went you know where these things are going to end up they're going to end up in landfill so i literally had the idea i'm going to text my my mate um with this idea which is uh, what about we shot these lion king ushis not in the natural habitat of the the beautiful plains of the serengeti but in landfill so i texted it to my mate tom witty who used to be the managing editor of the project and he's been EP of Australia Talks. So who I, who actually I met through um, Denise from Afters because she introduced, my wife got given an email saying we're looking for a writer to come onto this uh, panel. And I'm like, she wanted an advertising writer. I'm like, well, I'm not a real writer, but I'll, I'll go and say yes to it. And so I met Tom at this thing because he's this unbelievable powerhouse of incredibleness. 
Um, and we've done a few things together. So I texted him with this idea and he's like, I love it. And then we went, oh, let's get our mate Stu Morley, who we had also done some work with with Tom. And we went basically to Tom to Stu's studio like three days later. We bought some of the bloody things online and we shot them in his studio. Then we had a mate, uh, another mate who couldn't put his name to it because um, he works for a company that actually does some work for Coles and Woolworths. But he was like, I love this idea, so let's do it. And so he photoshopped it all and made it look like amazing. So he, we recreated scenes from The Lion King like Hakuna Matata and uh, or One Day All This Will Be Mine and Can You Feel The Love? Um, if hopefully you saw the imagery, it's pretty... We, we made them beautiful. So then you looked at them like, oh, they're beautiful. And then you went, oh, hang on. That's it in the tip. Oh, hang on, they're not walking on a bridge. They're walking on a rotten bloody toothbrush. So hopefully things like that. So we just did that. Um, within a week, we knew we had to get it out quickly because it's a short-term promotion. It's like a six or eight-week promotion. Um, and we basically, through Tom, he knew people at Triple J. So we were able to get it onto Hack. Um, and I also put it on my LinkedIn. So I literally put a post and saying future landfill because we've got to stop these plastic promotions and that has... I said over 50,000 views or something. And then we've had ten, tens of thousands of likes. A whole bunch of celebrities tweeted it out. I did lots of radio interviews. Um, it was on Channel 9 News. It was all over. It was on the front page of the Daily Telegraph on their, on their, um, oh, on the Guardian website. Sorry, it was on the front page of the Guardian website. It was pretty good. And so we basically did this um, and we kind of had both of the Coles and Woolworths on the back foot pretty straight away because there was a lot of press. And we actually had reached out to them about, you know, what's your recycling program? And they're like, oh, we believe in the environment. We do have a recycling program in place. Asterix runs out six weeks after the promotion. And as a test, I actually went around during the, the last week of the promotion and went to different Woolworths and, and asked them, I've got these Lion Kings, can I recycle them here? And to a person, they were like, huh, what? Uh, and then they asked their manager, do you know anything about the recycling program? And they'd be like, no. Nah. And we're like, cool so you've really planned this out well and so 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 it, was, it went massive it was mental it went tens of thousands like now actually part of it which was a good thing because from an advertising background i've always been taught you need a logo in the corner so we actually reached out to world wildlife fund um sea shepherd and uh, other environmental brands like greenpeace for them to see if they'd want to put their logo in. and they were all like we love it but we don't want to get sued so we can't have it and the great thing was because i just decided to do it with my mates um they all ended up sending it out um, to all their social media followings because it was how good is that? So we got three or the three biggest environmental brands in the world to share it. So that's millions of people. Anyway, I'm rambling, but we a lot of people said, oh, even a few radio interviews, just like, well, isn't it? It's easy to have a, have a pot shot of or worse. Can't you think of anything that they could have done? And so because we kind of anticipated that question, we kind of thought about it for about five minutes <laughs> and came up with it with an answer, um, which was maybe they could have done Lion King card collectibles but the cards could have been printed on seated cardboard so then after the promotion finishes you could then put them in the garden and, and continue the circle of life um and then so we we emailed that to Woolworths and they said same thing yeah thanks very much that's great blah 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 but you know our promotions our promotion and then a week later press release comes out oh Woolworths we're 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 going to do a seed program that's our next program and we're like and how are you going to do it don't know but we're going to do seeds so <laughs> it was interesting because we spent I think we spent $35 like literally buying the domain registry for futurelandfill.org, however much that was. Anything else was free. And Woolworths spent millions of dollars promoting this thing within a week. It was all over and they were doing a seeds promotion. And we're like, that's pretty cool that three guys basically came up with an idea and did something and it changed, uh, we're it change the landscape. I don't know how much much more likely they are to do more of these um, campaigns. But I think there's, and we see all the plastics and stuff. It's always in the news now. So you can't, kind of, it, it, the world's just changed, not because of just what we've done, but lots of people have done things. And I think we can all do that now. Yeah. How good does it feel to have been instrumental in something that's a force for good in the world? Yeah, it does feel good when you know you're doing something good. And that's what I found, like all the things that I've done recently, I haven't got paid money for them, but they're the things I'm by far the most proud of over you know, the ads that have cost, you know, a million dollars or more and they've spent millions of dollars on media. It's the things that I've done for nothing for good causes that actually affect people in a positive way that make me feel good and make me, my kids feel proud of me as well. Like that's the best thing is like seeing my kids actually, my dad did this, like that's a good feeling to know you've done something good. Um, so, yeah, I think if we can, we can all try and do more good in the world. That's, that's got to be good. 
Now, you talked about how important your collaborators are and they've got skills that you don't. Um, how do you how do you find collaborators? Are they people that you already know because you've been in advertising for a long time and have met interesting people or, yeah? It's kind of a combination of both, like, um, some of the people I use for, like, uh, you know, like Photoshop guy who did that, I'd work with him in AC Russell, I'd used to work with him, but a lot of the people, I, like the guy I did with the uh, Nicky Winmar statue with, is Aaron Tyler, I'd never met him, but he did something that was really cool. Uh, he did this thing called Australia Cash. I don't know if you've seen this, but everyone should should look it up. It's brilliant, where you basically reimagined all Australian currency with uh, everyday Aussie icons on it. So it's like Carl Stefanovic on the $20 coin and a $20 note or Agro on another one, Adam Good on the $2 coin. It was just so brilliant. It was so funny. It was Kathleen Kim was on the 50, I think. It's very funny. So I literally just emailed him and said, hey, man, I think this is awesome. I love it. And he was like, yeah, I love that thing where you plucked your hair out. And we just became friends. And I just texted him one day and said, hey, I've got this, I had this idea to build a statue of Nicky Wimmer because I'd become friends with him. I knew he was a footy nut like me. And so he was, and so I texted it to him again. I just texted someone because I'm, I don't like calling people because I don't like talking to people. Um, but anyway, he texted straight back saying, "Oh, here's a screen grab of my phone which has on the to-do list, make a Nikki Winmar statue." And she's like, "Oh, this is perfect." And so it's just, you just, you just, if you just keep talking about ideas and reaching out to people, the universe will make things work. I reckon if you keep the energy and the passion and the positivity up. Now, I also know that you have. With the Nikki Winmar statue, you did actually contact somebody who was instrumental in getting the statue made, yep. who you had never met before. Yeah. Can you? So, what did what did you say to her? Uh, so basically, because uh, we had got on to AFL three hundred and sixty, because we knew it was the twenty fifth anniversary of Nikki Winmar. You know, making the stand and pointing out the colour of his skin and saying, I'm black and I'm proud. And we knew that at 25th anniversary would probably be a lot of press around it. So the year before that, we started organising it. We got actually gone to the show AFL 360 and we thought we would raise, because we got the, you know, the we got Nikki on board, we got Wayne Ludby on board, who's the photographer, which again, we'd never met Wayne Ludby. We just emailed him. We found him on Instagram and just sent a picture of the mock-up that Aaron did of the Nikki Winmar statue and said, hey, Wayne, are you cool if we try and make a statue of your photo of Nikki? And he replied back like in a few minutes, he's like, I love it. Yes, absolutely. I'll do whatever I can to help. Um, so again, uh, so we just, so we got on the A4360, we thought we would get the money. Like we thought this will be a no brainer. We'll raise $180,000. Like I don't think that's much in the big scheme of things with the amount of people who love footy and like a week and a half in, we would have like 11 or $12,000 and we're like, no shivers off. Well, what's happening here? I thought there was enough woke white people around to want to put some money into this. And obviously we were wrong. So we started looking for AFL people who might be interested in it. And we just, we were just searching through Twitter, looking at AFL board members sort of thing. And we found this woman named Tanya Hosh, who was social inclusion um, and inclusion, in inclusion manager. And we thought, oh, maybe she's good and just scrolled down her feed and saw, oh, she's already tweeted out the, the campaign from AFL 360 about the thing. So we literally got onto LinkedIn, found her on LinkedIn, made you know, and sent her a message saying, hey, we're the guys who did the, the Nikki Winmar statue on A4360. Is there any way that you'd be able to help us promote it or something? And she replied back to us and said, yeah, whatever you want. It's a range of meeting. And within a week, uh, <laughs> we were at AFL house having a chat to her and she had her off and stuff talking about how much she loved the project and how she thought it was amazing. And then we were like 15 minutes into the meeting and she just says, oh, hang on a minute. And she, she stops talking to us and she gets on her phone like this and she dials the phone and so, we're like, what the hell's happening? And, and, and she's like, uh, yeah, I don't care what he's in. He, just, he needs to come down now. It's like, okay. And then she just continues the meeting. And then five minutes later, uh, the CEO of the AFL, Gillian McLaughlin stumbles in going, uh, hello, and Tanya's like, oh, these are the guys, Aaron and Alex, who are in the Nicky Wimar statue. And he's like, oh, you, oh yeah, well, the board loves this idea. We're going to help try and make it happen, make it a reality. So, yeah, it was just amazing. It just, I mean, it took another two and a half years and it was a complete, <laughs> it was an unbelievable journey. But without Tanya, it doesn't happen, no doubt about it. Um, but, yeah, just because if you have a good idea, like I said, I can, it was the right time as well because I'd actually pitched it to the AFL as part of it. So I did an ad for the AFL Indigenous round like five years earlier. 
because I knew then it was the 20th anniversary of Nikki doing it. So I got AFL players to reenact Nikki's stance. Um, and it was really, it was really cool. And the AFL bought it like that on the moment. But now they, they were going to do the statue, but then they never did because it actually is very, very difficult to make a statue, as we found out over two and a half years. But um, yeah, it was just, um, it's just amazing. It just was the right time because Tanya had been just recently appointed and she was just like, this is, this is the thing that this needs to be done. Um, for for AFL and not just for AFL but for, for for sports people and for even just humans because it's such a good story or terrible story but an amazing stance. Um, so yeah, just having her on board just made it happen. Just a good idea is the best in entree in um, entree to anybody. I've got this great idea and they're like, cool, let's do that. Do you get scared following your creative passion? Do you have those moments where you're like, oh my god, what if they think I'm a dick? Uh, I know I am a dick, so it's not a problem. <laughs> I've spent 20 years proving that professionally and 20 years before that as well. I know I, 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 it's funny, like I am the worst person for small talk. I cannot talk to people about just chit chat. I just, I'm just terrible. I can't do it, but I can talk to people about things that I think are awesome ideas that will help people. I can talk, like I can talk about all this stuff. I just can talk about it forever because I'm passionate about it. I think it's good and it's not about me. It's about the bigger idea. So that's where I don't have to worry about my ego or getting scared because I'm like, and also I find it via the internet, it's easy as well. Like if I had, if I saw Tanya Hosh in a room before I met her, I would never approach her. But because we have the, <laughs> being able to email or text people, it's easy for a completely socially awkward idiot like me uh, to, to make, to make, uh, to make inroads into making things happen. It's, I think you, I think the whole ego thing is really interesting. I know you used a phrase when we talked before, dissolution of your ego. How important is it to getting an idea up and running to just let go of our egos? Oh, it's totally important because it shouldn't be about you. It should be about the idea. Like the Nikki Winmar statue, what Nikki did was amazing. Wayne Ludby taking that photo and hearing what we're saying and making that happen was amazing. Tanya Hosh having the power to push that through all the other people at the AFL and get all these people are amazing. And that's something that's going to be bigger stand forever. I don't like the same thing with future landfill. It's not about what I did. It's about, this is a crap promotion. We need to do something about it. And there's lots of other people will hopefully believe the same thing. That's why I think it's important to know is that when you have an idea, I don't think you need to worry that other people won't like it because if you like it, then there's probably other people who will. You don't need to get, you don't need to get seven and a half billion people to like it. <laughs> you know, no, you know, no one's ever going to get everyone to like everything. So you just do something that you believe in. And if you keep telling people and enough people go, yeah, that's a good idea or it keeps reminding you that's a good idea, then you know it's a good idea. And just making it, that's the main thing. It doesn't matter. If, if you keep doing enough things, people will eventually go, who's the guy? Isn't that the guy who did that and that and that and that? Oh, cool. Rather than Alex Waddleton did so-and-so. Uh, to just Nikki Wimmer, Future Landfill book. Just keep, just have the energy to keep doing a million things and eventually someone will hear about you. And if, if they don't, you've still done a bunch of awesome stuff anyway. So who cares? <laughs> Now, I know a lot of us start feeling that we've not been successful if we don't get almost instant, instant, instant oh my God, I can't say that word, instantaneous Instant results. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, but nothing comes super quickly. Do you want to talk us through that process with your book, uh, Right Brain Workout? Because I you were a bit like a dog with a bone with that. Yeah. Well, as again, it was one of those ideas that just kept tapping on the shoulder. So basically I was working in a small agency and I was pretty miserable. I was you know, grumpy, grumpy Alex. And this young work experience kid came in and said, oh, can you give me some briefs? To, to, I want to be a, you know, working as creative and advertising. And I'm like, oh, you know, every advertising young kid's got a folio full of ads. Like, give me 10 minutes. I'll give you, just give me 10 minutes. Like, he, gave, he gave me 10 minutes. I wrote 10, just the most random, stupidest questions I could think of. And I said, come back with some creative answers to these things in a week and we'll see how we go. And I didn't think much more of it. And he came back a week later with this folio of the answers to the questions. Um, things like what was one of the questions was um, design a pair of shoes that you would use to climb up the side of a ship in 40 foot waves or something. And his design was insane. I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Sam, 
I don't know what his last name. I don't know where he is, but Sam, because of that, I went, there's an idea and it's bigger than just helping this kid have stand out from the other, every other advertising creative. So in that moment, I was like, maybe I could do a whole book of this. Maybe I could do this a thousand and one ways to be more creative. Maybe it could be called the right brain workout. I don't know. It all just popped into my head. So I basically started emailing all the people I've worked with who are creative, mostly advertising people. And so can you give me 10 questions? Maybe I'll get a hundred people. I got to like 650 questions. I was like, this is a lot of questions. <laughs> That's going to be a lot of work. So I thought maybe it's 365 days of questions. I was like, all right, I'm going to start designing it. Even though I'm a writer, I, just, I can dabble around it in Photoshop and in design and stuff like that. So I started designing it just in my spare time. Um, and because I'm a writer, it was a very, very slow process. I'm very bad at art directing and slow at it. But eventually I got to like 275 pages in because I was going to have right, uh, like a, a right brain tip every week as well. So I was researching scientific you know, ways to help you be more creative, all this sort of stuff. And I was laying it out and I was like, that was only up to like day 180. I'm like, this book's going to be 600 pages long. No one's going to want to pick up a book like this. So like maybe, maybe it could just be 10 weeks. And I was like, ha-ha, that means I've designed it. I don't have to do any more. <laughs> so like, this is great. I'm going to send this to publishers now. I'm going to send it to publishers. And so I send it to publishers. They're all electronic because they don't take phone calls. They don't let you mail it to them. You have to send it electronically. And I never heard a thing back from any of them. So I kind of left it for a while. But then it just kept saying, this is a good idea, Alex. Don't give up on it. So I saw Russell Howcroft had done a speech um, calling for Australia needing a creativity commission because... We're falling behind the rest of the world in our creative thinking because everything that we export, most of it is coal or, you know, oil or stuff like that. So that's going to obviously run out one day. And he was like, we need creativity to help future-proof our country. So because I'd worked with him previously, I just, I had his phone number and I just kept texting him, texting him and saying, I've got an idea that you, that you might like, that you might like for your creativity commission. And after a few weeks, he was like, oh, shit, sorry, Alex, I haven't got back to you. Can you come have breakfast with me Saturday morning at the Cheeky Monkey in uh, Richmond? <laughs> I said, sure. So it's like seven o'clock on or eight o'clock on a Saturday morning. And I'm as nervous as anything. And Russell knows every person, every person who walks past. Hey, Russell, hey, Russell. And eventually he's like, get to talking. I'm like, I love your idea of a creativity commission. So I've got this book idea. And I've told him the idea that maybe it could be this 10 weeks to retrain your brain to be more creative, a different creative question every day written by a different creative person that you feel in as you go with a pen or a piece of, uh, uh, with a pen. Uh, and he was like, yeah, yeah, that's a really good idea. And I said, well, I've actually printed some copies of it. I spent the, spent $600 printing 30 copies of this thing via cmykonline.com. Um, and I got them and um, I literally pulled the book out and he flicked through it and he went, I fucking love it. And I was just like, this, this I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And he's like, this is more than a book, Alex. This is, this is the whole business. And I said, funny you should mention that here's all the ideas I had for business. And he had even more, more better ideas stuff after that. And within a week he said, all right, Alex, what are you doing on Friday? I've got a meeting with the CEO, the publisher at large of Penguin. We're going to go in and present the idea, present the book to her. It's like, shit. And so, so basically the same thing. Russell's giving a great setup for it and says, Alex, this Alex has got this great idea for a book. And, um, she was still a bit the same. She's like, oh, yeah, sounds like a good idea. And then I pulled out the book and she did the same thing. So, oh, I love it. This is great. I can see this. And then she ran out the room, brought back another book. So maybe we could design it like this. And I was like, yeah, my design really is terrible, isn't it? <laughs> um, but, yeah, within, within like a week after that, like Russell said, like, I have a two-book deal with Penguin. We'll use – I've only done one book, so I need to do another book. This can be the second book, Alex. Are you in for that? I'm like, hell yeah, I'm into that. Uh, and then because having Russell on board has just opened up a thousand doors. Um, Russell, I love Russell um, because, you know, it was the whole thing. I could have 100% of nothing or I could have 50% of something massive. I'm like, again, that's the dissolution of ego. I, don't, I just wanted lots of people to, 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 to do it and to play with it and to put some joy and creativity into the, the world because there's so much negative stuff in the world. Whereas why don't we do something positive? So yeah, we, we, we got that book made, it went on sale in December last year, within two weeks, they were onto a reprint. And then in the middle of January, they emailed saying, all right, we're we on for book two for this year. And then like, cause it's, that was my whole plan is that every year there's a different book, volume one, volume two. And it's just awesome. Like we're developing a whole business behind it now. We've got, I've started doing podcast interviews. It was just, just, I kept going, that's a good idea. 
I think it's a great idea. Someone is going to finally agree it's a good idea. Like I talked to other people when I had printed the book and they were like, yeah, yeah, but I don't, know, I don't want to do anything with it. But Russell was like, I love this. Let's do it. And I love Russell. Thank God. Russell, love you. Uh, and he's awesome. And we're doing lots of things that's going to be cool. And a lot of people seem to be getting a lot of positive things out of it, which is the most important thing. It's it's a really amazing change from somebody who was miserable in advertising. What was there something that happened to you, like that turned you from miserable in advertising to somebody who went, you know what, I am just going to do some stuff for myself. I think basically it was a lot of things going really badly for me when I was just like, why do I care so much about this stuff where other people don't? I remember getting a brief at an agency for a sports betting brand. I'm not saying people shouldn't sports bet, but the brief, the, the, the advertising, they have this thing called the proposition, which is what's the one thing you want people to remember from your ad? And the line on it, which they presented with a completely straight face, was it's better to bet and lose than to not bet at all. And I'm like excuse me what that's legitimately what you reckon we should say and they're all, they're all like what do you mean what's the problem with that and i'm like really <laughs> can you not see the problem with that so it was that sort of thing i was like i said i worked at small agency and things weren't going well so i was just like i kept thinking it was the agency's fault that my ads weren't going through the way i wanted and i just realized i needed to do stuff for myself or else i'm always beholden to other people's opinions and so i've had enough of it I'm going to take responsibility for my life and stop blaming everybody else and stop competing with everyone else and trying to win more awards than that person and stuff. So I stopped competing. I stopped caring so much what other people thought and just started to do stuff. Cause I, like when I was doing the Nikki Wimmer statue had the idea, I had a, a whole bunch of my advertising friends go, Oh yeah, statue. Yes. This statue has been done before, but sure. Go for it. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like this is of the most important iconic moment in Australian sporting racial history and so when the statue came out it was like a week or two after the Khan advertising awards had happened when everyone was winning you know Khan gold lions and stuff like that and I'm like oh, I didn't win anything at Khan but I did get a 10 foot high bronze statue of Nikki Winmar built so there's a bronze <laughs> whatever I, I was just cool like I just was like I need to take responsibility for myself and stop blaming other people um because I was, I was just, I'd always play, I'd finger point everyone else and never just go, actually, Alex, the real problem is that you aren't taking responsibility for your life. So go and do something about that. And I think that that's, you know, that's, that's the, that's the nub of creativity and getting things done is you just have to do it. You have to not blame other people. You have to not live in fear of what everybody else is going to say. And and what it gives you is the reward. So do you want to talk to me a bit about that moment when the Nicky Winmar statue was launched and how that felt? And Well, it's like I was saying about the universe will guide you sometimes, like, which is my wife has been going on at me for years and years, and I finally listened to her. And, oh, my God, how much happier am I? You're an idiot, Alex. Anyway, but, they, but when the Nicky Winmar statue was being unveiled after two and a half years of stuff it was uh, at perth's optus stadium because uh nikki's uh, noongar man which is that's the area that the noongar are from and so with all his family were there there was like a hundred there's about a thousand people there like all the western secure supporters that come over and were, were there in the afl commission and they were all giving speeches like the the premier of wa gave a speech and it was just raining all day raining 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 so the premier of wa gave a speech it was raining the world it was raining, Sports Minister was raining. Gillian McLaughlin gave a speech, it was still raining. Tanya actually came up and gave a speech and she was hilarious because she was like, I'm going to make my, sports, my, my speech quick because this, this rain is going to turn my hair to shit, which was hilarious. And then she got down and then it was time for, um, there was another speech, it was still raining. And then there was like, all right, let's get Nikki up here to give a speech. <clears throat> and as he stood up, it stopped raining. This is no word of a lie. As he walked to the lectern, the clouds parted. And literally the first word he spoke the sun came out and the whole crowd was just like, it was, it was, it was the universe saying, this is the right thing to do. Here's the man who needs the spotlight. It's not all these other people who have contributed their way, but the person who's really done it is Nikki doing this amazing action. The sun came out for his entire speech. It was a brilliant speech. And then as soon as he stopped talking and sat, sat down, 
it started raining again. <laughs> it was insane. It was raining. It started raining and raining and raining. There's a couple more speeches and then it was like, all right, let's unveil the statue. So Gillen and who's the CEO of the AFL, the Premier of WA and Nikki all got up to pull the, the sheet off the, the statue and the sun came out again. And then it was sunny for an hour and a half, two, three hours afterwards. It was amazing. It was just like, I just think it's that thing. Like if you put enough positive vibes, if you do the right thing, I do think things just turn in favour of the thing that's the right thing, I think. And I think that's totally an example that I was just like, it was insane. It was just, I'll never forget it. I just tell this story, every person I met who they say, oh, do you know anything? Would I know anything you've done? Oh, you might've heard of the Nikki Vimar statue. Oh, tell me about that. Well, here's my story. This is amazing. Because I think it's incredible. Like it's just, it was unbelievable. So it's just, it's so cool to be able to be one of the few people who were there on that moment to experience just pure amazingness. And what you've created, what you've been involved in creating, um, will be there for centuries. Like that is a reminder to people about what happened and the power of one human being standing up to racism and to bullies. Like what a, yeah, way better yeah. Well, what was good was because we, when we were there for the, for the, it was the 50th derby, so they made it a big deal. And we went, we walked around the Oval before the match and we could see the dads having the conversation with the kids, the mums chatting to their daughter or something like that, to their son. And we could see Indigenous kids and adults coming up to it and pulling up their jumper and pointing to the coloured skin in front of Nikki. And I'm just like, that's why this statue needs to exist because people, 60,000 people a week, once the virus is over, 60,000 people a week will be coming to that stadium and they'll be walking past that statue. And even if they don't look at it again, they'll have seen it and they'll go, there's that Nikki moment and remind every single person who ever walks past it that we need to all treat each other fairly with respect and racism has no place anywhere. Um, and so it's so powerful to see that sort of stuff happening. And like when the sculptor was making it, he's like, this will last for a thousand years. Like that's how long it will last. And I'm like, but you think about it, that stadium will probably be knocked down and rebuilt multiple times while Nicky is still standing there strong and proud like he was in 1993. Like it's pretty, it's an epic moment immortalized forever in physical form. I think it's, I think it's awesome. I was going to swear. I'll try not to swear. <laughs> I, I think it's awesome too. I think it's totally awesome. I also am absolutely confident that watching this are people with ideas to do things that will have as much power as that statue. Yeah, absolutely. So, so speaking directly to those people, what should they do as soon as they finish watching this, what should they do to move their idea forward? Tell everyone, you know, <laughs> see if someone out of that will be able to help you and just keep going, just keep going and going and going and never give up. If you believe in it and other people you talk to love it and believe in it, just keep going and it will happen if you keep the energy up. That's the most important thing. Like it's easy, the easy bit is coming up with ideas. That's easy. I can come up with a million ideas, but it's and if the things that you make is what's the most important bit. And you will make everything if you just have the passion and the belief to do it. Just a few extra hours here and there, just keep doing it. Just keep chip, 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 chipping away. It's like a sculpture. You don't just go, Boom, sculpture. It's a lot of chip, chip, chipping and finessing and stuff before it gets into the final space. So just keep going. And like I, like I said, if a, a num numpty like me can make stuff happen, anyone can do it. Oh, Alex, thank you so much for sharing your passion, enthusiasm, and you're, you're such an inspiration of just doing it and hard work and cracking on. And I've I've loved talking to you. Um, thank you so much. No worries. And I also reckon when I've been doing all these things on the side, they haven't been hard work at all. Like they've just been something that I needed to do. <laughs> so it hasn't ever felt like work. The stuff that I get paid for can feel like hard work because you have so many things I'm doing on my own. They're not hard work. They're just fun and you just work at it. So that's the old thing. Uh, yeah, just, just try and just do it. Nike's line is the greatest tagline in advertising history, history for a reason. And yeah, well, do, you, do you know where that line, just do it, came from? Came from actually? It's actually no. a good story. So there was a, they got the brief and the guy who came up with the line, I can't remember his name, but he, he had watched, he'd read or watched the interview with a, um, with a prisoner who was on death row and he was about to get executed and he went, all right, 
just do it. Let's do it. And that's where the line came from was someone who was about to get, uh, get, get capital punishment. So, and then they died. That's where the line came from. So there you go. So inspiration can come from anywhere. <laughs> True. Oh God, that's, that's awful. Yeah. So next time you pull on a pair of Nikes, think about that guy who, uh, who said, let's do it as he got, as he, as he died. Yeah. What's the point? Think about that advertising guy who was like, oh, I could use that somewhere. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's what advertising people do. We just take a million things and just change it slightly until it's slightly less evil. <laughs> just take the evil edge off just enough so people can swallow it and then they die afterwards. <laughs> it's like can't, sugar coating the, the, the arsenic pill. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thanks that, for sharing your non evil note. side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Alex. Take no worries, care. Sister. Have a good one. Bye. Hey, Alex, that was great. That was such good fun. No worries, um, that was good.